scary. It is clear that you think and feel at the same time, and I mean you in particular, okay? There's just total thinking and feeling all mixed up and interleaved in your stuff. Now, you might think they're separate, and you, you can claim that they're totally separate. And if you're careful enough, they could be kept separate, and you can mix them that way. So it's possible, and you can claim it, and fine. I, I believe we're thinking and feeling at the same time, and I sometimes do get sloppy with use of the words, because I don't make a huge distinction in feeling and thinking. You, you start to touch on how they are related, but, you know, they're connected. And if I'm trying to think about enlightenment, then I'm trying to feel about it as well. You know, I think it's important to understand our feelings and work with them, just like we work with thoughts. I don't believe, oh, feelings have to be left all crazy, and thinking has to be all orderly. You know, no, thinking is, is left a little bit wild and organized a little, and thinking is left a little bit wild and organized a little. That, that's my approach. But I will be more careful uh, when I use the term, you know, feel and think. Okay. But it is ironic that someone that, that feels so strongly about what he thinks is so adamant about separating, so offended almost by the by the term feel. But the point is that, you know, there have been slave revolts in history and there's also been successful suppression of slaves. But how did slavery end? It was when enough people were enlightened about it, their pressure and action to, to end it started to have an effect. When there was a critical mass of people enlightened about slavery, and a thousand years earlier, there wasn't that critical mass. So what what happened? You know, what happened in the meantime? Okay, I am describing that process, the difference. Because a thousand years ago, they thought, you know, self-interest could include that. And they derived property rights that included property over human beings and other animals. And we still have the idea of property rights over other animals. So, what is the change of enlightenment? What is the trend? What causes this? What explain? What is the different perspective? Now, when you look to answer that, you answered that. You're talking about because you could see that you're equal to the other person. Their pain is the same as your pain. That's the feeling I'm talking about. Not everybody has that. Some people don't think. They are more selfish than that. But if you expand out and see how you are the same with this other person, then there's empathy there. And again, the feelings and thinking are linked because once you, let's say you never had any empathy for the other person, the other people, whatever, and you start to see, do you think, wait, we're pretty much the same. That'll give you empathy. On the other hand, if you're an empathetic person, that'll tell you that it's because you have this connection, you have a, you're the same in some sense. You know, and it's these bonding experiences that define these reactions. Some people, say even a hundred years ago, though now it's really common, couldn't see the similarity between the broken leg of a of the mammal and, and them. You know, they couldn't see that, they didn't get empathy because they didn't see the similarity of that. The animal to them was different enough. Okay, but, you know, it's always been pretty easy to see that, even during those times, you know, people almost went out of the way not to see, right? We have, it's easier to see this with animals that are similar to yourself, and then the less similar, the more difficult it gets. You know, by the, you get to insects, people, most people don't see it. And we can even have rational reasons and think about reasons why we maybe we shouldn't expect to see it because the nervous systems are different. But we still want to be in the ecosphere with, with bugs. We have other reasons, but we have to get more creative to see how we're all connected together. But we know people do see this. You said it. You said we should look at the broadest, you know, uh, 
sphere possible in the universe. So that includes all the plants and animals. And we should see that really we're the same in a sense. We're all just trying to survive. Um, we all use the same biochemistry, uh, more or less, you know, more similar than dissimilar. And uh, seeing this is the process of enlightenment. Now, I'm not saying that every individual is going to see their best interest uh, as not owning slaves. And I don't think we can even say that if that it is in their best interest if they're going to keep their little tiny personal frame of reference. But I don't have that frame of reference. The only reason I'm, I'm thinking about what's right for them is because I have a broader frame of reference. And I look at him and I say what's better for him is to be in a system that isn't slavery run. You know, slave societies have, you know, chronic problems associated with them. But if he doesn't see it, you know, then it's going to become the numbers. There's him and then a bunch of slaves. You know, when we add all of those self-interests up, he's not going to, his view is not going to weigh the average that heavily. All those slaves that want to be free are going to outweigh him. And then he just becomes a criminal because he's trying to oppress them. And regardless of whether he's a criminal or not, they're going to fight him for their freedom. No, it doesn't always take that because people are getting enlightened. And this reaction, the violent reaction from the slaves is just one force. And people that like to own slaves are kind of fine with that system because they like proving themselves by being macho killers anyway. So that, that fed into their their whole schema. So, you know, that alone does not work to free slaves. But social movements do. Social movements among the free people that are enlightened enough to see how that's wrong because they could be in that position. And you like to emphasize that, the relativity that I could be in that position. Fine, and this is a mental exercise we could do. You know, you see even an animal, you feel sorry because you, even if it's an animal and she's lost a, you know, a cub, you see, oh, you know, you can see, I can imagine being a mother and losing that cub. You know, you can see that. That's just another way of putting this, feel, sharing the frame of reference where we're all the same. We're all combined. We're all categorized in the same group because of the things we share that we have in common. And we can see that we have them in common so we can think of what it's like from other points of view. I can imagine what it's like if you get really hungry, because I've been really hungry, and so on. And I'm just explaining what this process is, what has changed in our minds as we have these more enlightened ideas. And what it is is that we're growing broader frames of reference. Now, if I was to argue to a slave owner of why not to hold slaves, um, that would be slightly different than me talking to you, someone that already knows slavery is wrong, and everybody out there that already knows slavery is wrong. To them, I'm just describing, here's how you got to where you are now. It's useful because maybe you want to go somewhere in the future and see even more. Okay, And this is the longitude and latitudes of our enlightenment progress. And I don't even suggest rushing too much, but I also don't suggest just waiting around for it to feel. I mean, the thing is, you can wait around, but it's a process of enlightenment that's going on around you. So if you're the slave owner and you're like, I think I'll wait to get enlightened, I kind of like this deal, then you're going to fall way behind and you will be swept into the, you know, the dust heap of history.